Okay. Good evening to everyone. We are happy to see you all during this event organized by the Center for Urban History. This is one of our regular events. We hope we are going to have more of them. And this is part of the program that we now call like the sources of choice. But it is also affiliated to the project uh, run by the Center for Urban History that we started in the first half of this year. We were trying to collect all of the possible types of eager documents, oral testimonies, uh, stories of people. I believe the collections that we have accumulated uh, have value. They have value for the future and for the future historians and researchers. One of our initiatives uh, as part of this project focused on recording the diaries that also included the descriptions of dreams that people had uh, when sleeping. This is not a big collection per se. We are not trying to transform it into anything large because these are quite intimate stories shared. These were parts of the dreams and these were the dreams that the students shared. These are the students of the Ukrainian Catholic University. Later, we also recorded some dreams that our colleagues uh, have seen. And now we have this special collection in the Center for Urban History. This is the collection of dreams. During this project, uh, we came across uh, many interesting researchers. One of them is our tonight's speaker, Billy Glue. He is from uh, the mixed family. We could say it's an international family. His wife uh, comes from Ukraine, is uh, really supportive of Ukraine. <laughs> Bill Iglu is uh, lecturing in the UK, but I will explain more when I switch into English now. And Billy will start this launch event because this is going to be the series of events. Next month, we are going to have another event. We will have Wojciech Charski, quite uh, well known person in Poland, in uh, Eastern and Central Europe, who studies the dreams. He's going to speak about the dreams of the prisoners of uh, Auschwitz who that were recorded in the 1970s by the researchers. This project was well documented and Wojciech was doing that study and also uh, published uh, several valuable papers uh, about the dreams and the topics of the dreams that the prisoners of Auschwitz had during the Nazi occupation of Poland. Tonight, we are going to talk about uh, different types uh, of dreams uh, and other related aspects. I also have a technical announcement for our Ukrainian participants. I will now switch into English, but I will need to explain where we could uh, activate the language interpretation function. You have on the lower bar of the Zoom panel the options to activate your language interpretation. We have the interpreter with us, Svetlana Bregman, and if you don't feel comfortable listening to English, you can listen to the simultaneous Ukrainian interpretation. And I'm now going to repeat the same thing uh, in English for the participants who come from other countries, and you can choose any channel you feel comfortable with. Then we are going to have Billy Clue reporting his ideas, and then we are going to have Stanislav Tsalik, the researcher from Kiev who is temporarily relocated to Poland, but I will introduce him in more details after Billy. So we are going to have an interesting and exciting night tonight. Uh, uh, to see you in this evening in ukraine it's evening probably if you are in the uk it's uh, it's still afternoon uh, but uh, uh, we have this beautiful opportunity to come uh, to connect various worlds and various cultures and uh, the project we uh, start today is connected to ego documents to various types of documents 
And the Center for Urban History was active in collecting various formats of documents since the, the, the start of war. Uh, though we, we, we were doing this even before the war, but then when the war started, uh, Center collected uh, digital, arc, uh, digital documents, but then also recordings, uh, various forms of wit witnesses uh, and uh, uh, textual and visual materials, audiovisual materials. And among these uh, ego documents uh, or, or documents, uh, there was a selection of dreams. And uh, uh, while working on dreams, uh, we en uh, encountered uh, a research of Billy Glue, uh, who will uh, deliver his presentation today for us. And uh, uh, this is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Billy Glue, uh, who works in the areas of digital film, sound and music in the United Kingdom. In his practice research, uh, PhD thesis, uh, he worked on uh, uh, screening dreams. So basically he was uh, dealing with the idea and theory of dreams, but then also how dreams are uh, depicted, represented or used in film, uh, in various films. And uh, he used four uh, theories of dreams. And I think he will talk about this in this presentation. And uh, uh, basically, uh, this is already uh, many years of uh, interest for uh, Billy Glue. Uh, and uh, he also uh, uh, works as a pra pra practicing, uh, you may say, artist, film director. So he's doing sound and film. Uh, and uh, he is teaching these disciplines for his students. Uh, uh, our second participant I will present after Billy. Uh, so uh, now, uh, Billy, you are with us. I, I don't see what you are behind the, uh, uh, the dark screen. So let's wait that Billy appears. Okay, yeah, Billy is with us. And uh, uh, we have... Uh, uh, already the full set of uh, our uh, guests. And I ask you, kindly ask you to mute your mics while Billy is presenting. And uh, Billy, please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. You can hear me okay? Right, I'll share my screen now, okay? Um, so I'll just press all the right buttons, hopefully. Okay then. Uh, you can see that, okay. You can see my uh, screen, can you, uh, everybody? You can see that? Yes, yes, Billy, everything right. is fine. Right, thank you. Okay, I'll get started then. So, um, so today, what I'll be looking at um, is we, we're going to be looking at war, like uh, dreams, dream sequences in, in war films. Okay, that, that's the focus of the talk. I'll give some backgrounds. Uh, in, in general, on my research on dream sequences in films. So that hopefully um, that'll provide some good sort of background and context. And then the plan is to sort of then look at films that are specifically in, in, in war movies and to see if there's any sort of uh, differences or similarities between non-war dreams um, and just to investigate that uh, a little bit. So that, that's kind of uh, mainly what we'll be covering. Um, yeah, and then later on, I suppose people will be able to ask questions if, if they have anything that's uh, interested them. Right, so here we go. So, okay then. So we'll just blitz straight through. So on this slide, so the thing that I wanted to say, first of all, is just to sort of, uh, just to provide some background about um, why we use uh, dreams in films, why filmmakers um, use dream sequences, okay? So this is um, often, there's, there's many different reasons why people use dream sequences in films. So what I'd like to say, first of all, is that when we show in a movie, often what we're using is a visual uh, storytelling, okay? And if we use um, visual storytelling, sometimes if we want to say what's happening uh, emotionally, or um, intellectually uh, inside a character, like thoughts that they're having, uh, emotions that they're feeling. Sometimes the actor can portray these on the face, of course, 
but other times it's difficult to express um, how somebody feels inside. So if we're, for example, we're reading poetry or if we were reading a novel, uh, the writer could explain how a person's feeling, how a character's feeling, and that would feel quite normal to us, I think, where usually when we read a novel. But in a film, it's uh, sometimes more difficult uh, to, to show these states, all right? So this is where dreams come in very helpful uh, and from a storytelling aspect uh, for filmmakers. So some examples are, uh, for example, in a film called The Passion of Anna, which is a, an Ingmar Bergman movie, um, a character is feeling guilty um, because um, they caused a car accident. And in the car accident, some of their family members were killed. Now, if unless you want to use uh, like dialogue for the character to say, today I'm feeling guilty because of something happened in my past, this could be quite a clumsy way to show how someone's feeling. By having the character have a dream, uh, it's possible to uh, show these uh, thoughts and feelings the character's having, but in a visual way and in a way which feels, um, I think, uh, is more successful from a filmmaking perspective. Uh, another example, in the movie The Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie, uh, a character is uh, missing his mother because his mother died and uh, he thinks about her sometimes. So the character has a dream about his mother uh, and this can show how he feels about her, but visually it can show uh, how he thinks about her. Um, and also he can meet her in the dream uh, and he can talk to her and tell her how he feels. They can have a conversation together, which would be difficult to do um, otherwise in, in the filmmaking. Another technique that's often used in movie making is if you have a mystery or some kind of a story like this, where there's some kind of details that are slowly being given out to the audience. So they're putting together like, like in a thriller or something like this. So for example, in the movie, uh, Before I Go to Sleep, a character has some, uh, she, she's been attacked and uh, she got hit, hit on the head and she can't remember who's attacked her, right? And this is like a, a key part of the story of the movie. So what can happen in the dream is the character can gradually sort of start to um, remember some bits of information, which means that the audience then can also get access to bits of this information. And then the, the, the audience, along with the protagonist, are trying to piece together who the person is who may have attacked her. Um, in the movie Spellbound, um, which used some sort of psychoanalytic theorists, mainly Freudian theory, um, you have a character there who's uh, recounting a dream to two psychoanalysts and together the characters are trying to piece together what this dream might mean. And this is all giving clues to try and solve some kind of mystery. Um, and uh, then another thing that happens in a lot of films is what we call premonitory dreams. And these are dreams that set a chain or series of events from uh, starting. Uh, for example, in the movie Terminator 2, a character dreams that there will be a nuclear explosion and the nuclear explosion will kill a lot of people. So then the rest of the movie, part of the, or at least part of the rest of the movie, the lead character has to now try to prevent, or one of the lead characters has to try to prevent this from happening. So it like sets a series of events uh, going and now it's like the drama is whether or not these events can be prevented or not. Um, another example of using dreams is when a character is having some kind of changes uh, physically, but they can't be shown on camera yet. So this is often used in uh, horror movies and sometimes in what we call body horror. So for example, in a movie, An American Wolf in London, a character has been bitten uh, and they think they've been bitten by a dog, but really they've been bitten by a werewolf. So uh, because the character isn't changing yet or anything like that, somehow the filmmaker has to show that there's something different happening to the, to the protagonist. So by making the protagonist have a horrifying dream um, with a, like a very violent dream, it sort of shows that there's some kind of internal conflict going on in the character. And that's a way to sort of like visually show this and also to keep in the keeping of a horror movie sort of genre. So it can be very violent, for example. Um, other things that are often used uh, showing in dream sequences can be states of anxiety. Um, so uh, a dream can show like, uh, can, can reflect that. 
Um, sometimes a character might be feeling guilt and uh, other than like facial expressions, if they want to show more complex feelings of guilt, uh, a dream sequence can show that, such as in Stranger on the Third Floor, where a character's feeling guilty about the way they've acted towards some other people. Um, a dream can be used to show mental uh, health problems or even schizophrenia, like in a one-hour photo where a character um, has a very normal life and it seems very boring. But when they're asleep, their dreams are very disturbing. And uh, this is used to show that the character uh, isn't all as they seem uh, in one-hour photo. Uh, and a dream can also be used to show that a character might be suffering from some sort of problem such as PTSD, so it's post-traumatic stress disorder. So this is using the movie Interstellar, where uh, the lead character is reliving some sort of traumatic experience that they had uh, in their dreams. They're sort of reliving it, uh, this experience. And of course, another way we can use dreams is to show private fantasies that a character has. So there's quite a few films that use that. Uh, and one movie that does that is the movie Enemy. OK, I'm going to move to the next slide now. So this is some background about why, why, why do we use dreams in films? So many types of films from like uh, art house films to uh, blockbuster films to uh, animation such as Shrek 3 or something like this. Uh, many types of films use dream sequences. OK, so uh, the question that I was interested in is how do we know we are watching a dream sequence when we're watching a movie? Uh, also to think about how closely the film dream sequences replicate the experience of dreaming. Like when, well, when, when we watch when we watch a dream sequence, um, we got some. Uh, yeah, when we watch a dream sequence, um, how um, close does it replicate the, the the like a real dream, if we will? Uh, how I approached this was I looked at the dream theories of four different. Uh, I looked at four different dream theories. Uh, which kind of like conflict with one another to see if there was one of these dream theories or a combination of them, but particularly sort of was suited to uh, filmmaking. And the dream theories I looked at was those of uh, Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung, and then also Alan Hobson and Antti Revanceau. So those were the theories I looked at. There's obviously other dream theorists, but I picked these particularly because they kind of opposed to each other a little bit. Um, and then also I was interested in if we, how we show these like unconscious elements uh, in filmmaking, um, like uh, hidden elements uh, that a person might be experiencing. We can move on to that later, maybe. Right. So just as an overview, I'm not sure how much the people who, you, you here know about dream theories and things like this. So this is just like a real brief overview of like the different theories that I used when I was uh, analyzing uh, the dream theories, uh, sorry, the dream sequences. Uh, uh, yeah, so th these are the theories anyway. So there's Freud, and uh, Freud is a very famous uh, dream theorist. Uh, he interviews, uh, introduced uh, the movie through, the, through the book Interpretation of Dreams. Uh, this is like uh, seen as like, I don't know, like the grandfather of dream theories or something like that. Um, and uh, he comes up with a lot of very influential, important ideas um, that um, like influence many people who come after him. Um, some of his ideas now, I would say, are quite contentious. And I would, I, I would say that quite a lot of people who study dreaming um, are quite like critical of a lot of Freud's ideas now. Um, so, but having said that, I would say that there's still many of his ideas that do um, are definitely worthy of considering and um, are worthy of like, yeah, when, when we're thinking about dreaming, I think it would, it would be wrong to discount all the ideas of Freud just because some are controversial and some are not. Um, and he certainly has a very big influence on culture and, uh, and uh, artists and filmmakers and things like this. So there's some examples there I've put of people who are in influenced by uh, Freud's ideas. Um, so the key point about Freud is that he has this idea that when we dream, we have something called manifest content. That's like the pictures of the dream. So when you're having a dream, those are like what you see when you're dreaming or what you hear or experience, what you experience when you're dreaming. But he says that underneath this, there's something called latent content. And that's like the real meaning of the dream uh, that's, that's hidden. And the idea is that if through psychoanalysis, through like analyzing the dreams, it's possible to work out what the real meaning of the dream is. And uh, from Freud's perspective, the meaning of the dream 
is usually connected to a childhood uh, wish or childhood fantasy. And furthermore, that the childhood fantasy is uh, sexual in nature, right? This is like a key part of his, it's not the only part, it's a key part of his theory. Um, and then we have Carl Jung, who is kind of, um, uh, who has some crossovers in her theory there, but um, one of the key differences in his theory is he argues that people have um, like a, they have a pers personal conscience. So that's all the things that you're thinking of right now uh, while you're awake. And then you have a personal unconscious, which is all the things that you kind of, you that, that you're not thinking about right now, but you could kind of remember if you wanted to. And then that drifts into things that you've sort of suppressed or repressed, things that you don't want to remember or things that you've kind of can't recall back. And that's like the personal unconscious. But he also has this idea of something called the collective unconscious. And this is an idea that because human beings are like very ancient, that there's been like many thousands of years of human beings, there's some parts of us that are like, every human being has like some specific shared qualities uh, within them. And the idea is that uh, when we dream, when we're not consciously trying to like uh, guide how we think, when we dream, there's certain images uh, that like uh, uh, and experiences that occur in dreams um, that are common to all people. So if a person from a thousand years ago or a person now has a dream, there'll be certain characters who appear in our dreams that have uh, appeared in all these other people's dreams as well. They might be clothed differently because culturally people dress differently or something, but the actual characters are, are similar, for example. And his idea is that so if a person has certain problems uh, emotionally um, or certain thoughts or anxieties or wishes or experiences, when you're asleep, what happens is they kind of mix together. And when they mix together, the certain like combinations of those emotions and feelings cr cause certain figures to kind of rise up in our dreams, depending on what that combination of things is that we're thinking about when we're OK, and then so the idea is if we analyze what those figures are or what those uh, objects are in the dream or locations that can tell us something about the person uh, that they weren't aware of uh, uh, when they were like consciously considering uh, like, a, yeah, when they weren't con consciously thinking about things. So this is collective unconscious. We can talk about it more if anyone has any questions about it. Uh, and Freud has this idea called phylogenetic inheritance, which is kind of like similar, uh, but he sort of like has this different phrase for it. So it sort of enables him to distance his theory from Jung, uh, make it, maybe make himself sound a little bit more scientific as well. But they're quite similar ideas, actually, when, when you like look at them. So those are those two theorists. And then the other two I looked at, one was Antti Rivonsuo uh, from Finland, and uh, he's key theory is that all dreams are threat simulations. So his idea is that when early man, like early modern man, the, the life that they were living was extremely dangerous. They had a very short life expectancy. So it was a very dangerous place to live, uh, very hard to find food, um, very many threats of, around. So the idea is that while you're asleep, you're kind of doing almost a virtual reality run through of different survival strategies. And so the idea is that then when you're awake, you have a better chance to um, to live because you've practiced like different su survival techniques, for example, fighting or or running away or something like that. So this is like his theory, um, and so it's a very clear theory. So it's and it, and that lends itself to filmmaking actually because uh, with the Carl Jung and the Freud theory to really understand what a dream means, you have to think about some sort of hidden layers and some like other understanding of the dream which can be quite difficult in a movie. If a film's going and it's like progressing, you can't stop a film like with a book and think about it for a while. It's always like moving forwards. So uh, if you have a dream that's a Freudian styling or Jungian styling, um, you need for everyone in the audience to understand that dream at the same time, the same way, it can be quite difficult. Whereas if you have a, a dream that's like a threat simulation dream, it's very clear um, what the uh, character's dreaming about. It's very clear, like, um, what their goal is, like, that they have to survive or they have to complete a task or something like that. So um, I think that it lends itself very well to uh, filmmaking, this particular dream theory. 
Um, and then also Alan Hobson, who had two key theories, really, um, recently died. Um, he's um, a very strong, extremely anti-Freudian uh, theorist, like really opposite to Freud in many ways. What's strange is that one of the ways he became very, he, he, he is known is because of his anti-Freudian views. So strangely, for because Freud's around was around and because he criticised Freud so well, it sort of perhaps raises his profile for some people. So it's a strange one because the person who he most disagrees with by commenting on him, it sort of like raises his own profile. It's a strange situation. But he had two key theories. One is called activation synthesis. This is what he devised. Um, so he sort of presented that in 1988. The, the idea is that in this dream theory, that dreams have absolutely no meaning whatsoever. And the idea is that uh, when you're asleep, just random uh, neurons are fired in your brain. And then your brain tries to make sense of these random neurons, which, which trigger memories by creating a story. So his idea is that's like what dreams were with that theory. But of course, each person then has a specific, a certain dream. So you can then argue, well, why does that person have a certain dream rather than a different dream? So if it's still... You can still kind of analyze the person's dream, even if it's an activation synthesis dream. But this is his first idea that dreams don't really have a, have a meaning. But then he changed his theory in 2000. You're on, right? Can we turn the microphone off, please? Thank you. So, um, and then from uh, 2009, uh, he has this new theory called proto consciousness. So, this is a theory that when a baby is in the womb, before the baby is born, uh, that the baby is having a lot of REM sleep, a lot of REM sleep. And the idea is that they're running through different physical sort of actions, preparing themselves uh, for when they're born. And, and the idea is, it, so it's like, again, like a virtual reality idea, but it's not just for threats, it's for like all different types of actions. So there's a lot of similarities with that theory with Rivoncevos, but it's probably broader. Well, it is broader. So that's his second uh, theory, proto-consciousness, which he was de developing and working on until he died. Those are the four theorists. So I hope that's all okay for everybody. So I analysed 50 dream sequences. There was 50 dream sequences that I went through. And having gone through them, what I found was, regardless of whatever country, genre, era, from silent movies till now, every film maker who creates a movie only use 12 different techniques to create a dream sequence, right? So they might only use one of these techniques or they might use all 12 of them. But the point is, these are the only 12, these are the only techniques in any dream sequence, okay? So nearly always, like 99% of the time, number seven, uh, starting and ending the sequence with an action a dream uh, uh, takes place is, is included. But many, like at element one, is extremely common in many, many dream sequences. And each one of these, uh, these, these are the 12 dream denoting elements that I worked out by analyzing a, a very large amount of dream sequences. This is the findings that I came up with, which I'll go through as, as we look at these war dream sequences. So uh, what we'll do now is we'll go on to these war dreams and then we can refer back to these dream denoting elements uh, as we do so, all right? So uh, what we can say is uh, in the war dreams, uh, the ones that I was looking at for this talk, um, nearly all of them um, feature fictional characters, right? Nearly all of them feature fictional characters. Um, but uh, there's one in the movie Flags of Our Fathers uh, where the author uh, includes his father as one of the like, lead characters, uh, John Bradley. So in that movie, there's a, a real person being depicted. But in the other films, it's fictional characters. Um, however, for example, Journey's End, which is one of the dream sequences we'll look at, this is based on a, a 1928 play by a World War I veteran. So even though it's a fictional, the fictional characters, it's based very strongly in a real event, which is the German Spring Offensive of uh, 1918. Uh, and um, what happened to the soldiers who were like caught up in that? Um, so, yeah, so we've and uh, we can see the characters, the different uh, protagonists we've got in Journey's End. We've got, uh, the, 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 the dreamer, the protagonist is a soldier who's 
struggling to deal with his emotional issues, so he, he drinks heavily. Uh, in Music in Darkness, uh, it's uh, af just after World War II, and this is a blinded soldier uh, who has the dream. Uh, in Ivan's Childhood, uh, this is a, a Russian boy, like a Soviet boy, uh, whose parents have been murdered by uh, the, the Nazis, and he becomes a scout uh, to try to fight back sort of uh, 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 in that movie. In Women, Woman on the Beach, uh, this is uh, an ex-Navy officer who's suffering from PTSD and he, um, he, his ship sank and uh, he's like, uh, uh, this is his dream. Uh, and in uh, Kagimushu, this is uh, set um, in 16th century Japan, so it's the backdrop against, it's like real combat, it's like real um, events that were taking place, but uh, fictionalised characters. Uh, we have other types of dream sequences in war movies. For example, uh, we can have a, a real event, which is the Nagasaki bo bombing, which is the uh, one of the atomic bombs that was dropped uh, at the end of the Second World War. And uh, but the, the character is a fantasy character. So he's Wolverine, who is an, an X-Man, uh, a superhero. And uh, but he's like there when the Nagasaki bombing goes off. So this is one of his like reimaginings of history where uh, this character was part of the uh, American forces during the Second World War. And then there are also fictional wars uh, in like a sci-fi setting. So in Terminator 2, uh, a kind of a freedom fighter, Sarah Connor, this dream is set in the future, 2029, and she dreams that a nuclear explosion goes off. Or we have a, a fictional sort of sci-fi setting where an American president has a nightmare that his wife is killed by a nuclear explosion. Um, or we have um, a NASA ex NASA pilot uh, in Interstellar, but it's set in the future. It's like a sci-fi adventure. So those are some of the different war dreams. One of the key things straight away we can note is that a lot of these films open with the dream sequence. So Music in the Darkness opens with a dream sequence, as does Ivan's Childhood, as does Woman on the Beach, uh, as does Dreamscape, actually, and as does Wolverine. So all of these films open with a dream sequence and interstellar the dream sequences right near the start as well. I'm pretty sure. Okay. So we've got that. We keep going on. So I wanted to show a couple of dream sequences just as um, just to, so we can think about, about them. Uh, I think on my time, I've probably took a, a bit of time to talk there. So I won't show all four of these, but we can show a little bit of them. Hopefully that's okay. Um, so I wanted to show, um, I'll show this uh, dream sequence from, um, I show this one Journey's End, I think. I've got a DVD uh, set up ready to play. I really hope it works. <laughs> we'll see in a moment, won't we? Right, so I'm just going like, to open it up and fingers crossed it works. Uh, here it comes. So this is Journey's End. This is set in World War I. And this is a, a soldier who's like, is basically suffering from PTSD, really. Um, and he's coping with it through drinking alcohol. And um, he's about to have a dream anyway. So I'm just gonna, I really hope this works. Let's see what happens. Okay, so that's that dream sequence. I hope it worked okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, going back to these techniques. Um, 
So some of the important things that we've got there, we've got an alteration of colour, right? The colour changed uh, when it switched to the dream sequence. Uh, as the figure walks towards the uh, fire, there's some slow motion there. Um, it violates the usual cause of the rules of cause and effect because the character is on a bed and then suddenly is in a trench. Uh, on top of that, there's an explosion goes off, but it makes hardly any sound. Um, this one here, it's difficult to understand the logic how the protagonist acts because he walks towards the explosion rather than running away from the explosion. So one and two is used. Um, then we go to um, an over the shoulder shot as he walks towards the explosion. So four is used. Um, an explosion goes off. Uh, but a key for number five, sorry, what I was going to say is the, the camera twists. So because the camera twists, this is to surprise the audience. You think he's lying down and he's not. Um, this diegetic sound is only sparsely used there's, um, because you, we hardly hear the explosion. So this, this technique is used. At the start of the sequence, as he rolls over, his eyes close for a few seconds, which shows that he's drifting into sleep. Um, the character is in a trench, which is in a World War I setting where usually there'd be lots of soldiers uh, and there aren't any other soldiers, just him. And finally, he's in a trench, which is the same shape as a path or corridor. So what I'm hopefully showing you is that this is a like a clear example of it's like a really good pro forma example of a dream sequence that used nearly every one of these uh, techniques. OK, so hopefully that's like a, a nice example. Um, so what we'll do now is we'll just look at another example. This is from the movie Flags of, uh, Flags of Our Fathers. So I'm hoping that this will work. Uh, correctly, uh, fingers crossed it will. Um, I can't guarantee everything's going to work properly, but I'm going to try my best. Right, so um, let's have a look. Um, okay, so I'm just going to mute it a minute while it just moves. So hopefully everyone can see this all right. I'm going to put it on full screen and I'm going to jump straight to the dream sequence. So this is a World War II uh, dream sequences and this is uh, from Flags of Our Fathers so it's the Pacific uh, campaign of the Americans we fashion the night OK, so that's that dream sequence. So why I think this one's important, and I think it's like really well made dream sequence personally, um, it, 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 one of the key points that it touches on is the fact that it shows that people can suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder many, many years after uh, the events that they've experienced, you know, that um, it's, it's not something that can just... Once somebody's had a very strong experience, a very strong emotional, psychological experience, you know, this can stay with them for the rest of their life, okay? And uh, that, that's what I think this captures really well. You know, I think it's like, uh, it's an interesting way to open the film as well. The fact that it cuts between time as well. This is another really effective thing that dream sequences can do. You can cut from somebody's like youth to their old age uh, very quickly and very effectively just by showing somebody an older person dreaming of when they were younger. Uh, looking at the dream sequence techniques there, uh, you've got the protagonist again is alone, uh, whereas this is a battlefield that is just this one person by himself there. Um, we've got this low definition obscuring of the image. I think it's a really good example of using that where the character's face uh, obscures a lot of the background. Um, and so there's like some theories on this, so some media theories. Uh, Marshall McLuhan used this theory 
uh, uh, media theorists, and also Herbert Zettel, American film and TV theorist. They argue that when um, an image is like low definition, it encourage audience uh, participation because they try to imagine to try to kind of guess what the rest of the image might be. And I think but this sequence does that. So the idea, I think it, it, it encouraged the audience to imagine from the perspective of the dreamer because you can't see everything that's there on the screen. Uh, it kind of for, it maybe forces you to try and guess or imagine what the character might be thinking or feeling. So it, it, it encouraged you to become part of you know, to, to try and imagine for that, that experience and perhaps encourage some immersion there and some engagement with the character, some empathy maybe, or, or at least sympathy with the character. Uh, it starts and ends with uh, action to show a dream took place. There's an exclusion of diegetic sound. Uh, so there's many of these techniques are used in this dream sequence. So those are some examples. And so I don't run out of time. I'll move on, all right? But um, I've got some other examples that we can look at if we want to, um, you know, later on in the talk or something like that. So um, when just as a comparison of techniques, there was, like I said, there was 50 sequences that I looked at originally. And um, this is like a count up of how many of each of those sequences, like um, it's, it's like a count of which techniques were most commonly used, right? So like this blue bar, uh, which is like from, I don't know if you can see where I'm moving my pointer, but like from here onwards, like this is like 50% or more of the shots uh, used um, like this technique, for example. So for this one, it violates effect, nature and physics. Like, so somebody can fly or someone's in a different location to they were before, or now they're older or younger than they were or something like that. We can see this is like a really common a technique in the dream in the, in in many dream sequences uh, because seven out of fifty and seven out of fifty and when we add all these up over half of the sequences use this technique right so this is like a very common technique to use in dream sequences um, and uh, when I go to um, the next uh, slide um, what we can see here uh, which is uh, to do with the exclusion or sparse use of diegetic sound this is like a super common uh, technique uh, used by many filmmakers to show that something uh, is a dream. Uh, so like here, uh, this bar is 90 to 99%. So the first, the, the dreams that I looked at, the first 50 I looked at, you know, um, over a fifth of them, uh, 90% of the shots or more um, had, had like no or very sparse diegetic sound and well over, you know, there's like a high amount of the um, dream sequences used um, no diegetic sound or very little diegetic sound. Okay, so that's the point what I wanna put across there really. Uh, when I looked at the first 50 that I was looking at, uh, what I did find was uh, many of them didn't use this technique, but someone is alone with uh, only one or two people in a usually busy location. Those that did, it was like a really key part of the sequence, but a lot didn't, right? Um, so why I want to mention that is that when we look at the war dream sequences, this is actually quite a common element of the war dream sequences. And I think this marks out the war dream sequences as being a bit different uh, to non-war dream sequences. This seems to be a very important uh, element um, of those sequences. Okay. So I'll keep moving forward, but we, uh, so this, this can be something that we can, I can pick up on again in a couple more minutes. So um, I wanted to show uh, this one part of this one dream sequence. So it's a bit, bit of a controversial sequence, I suppose, because um, we've got a lot of uh, people in uh, Ukraine uh, what, uh, uh, at this uh, talk. So I just want to clarify by saying Tarkovsky, who's the director of this movie. Um, so he's like a Soviet area film director, but he's quite critical, I think, of, um, of uh, Soviet, um, the Soviet world or... Uh, and, and politics uh, eventually like making films outside of the Soviet Union. Uh, some other things that was interesting for Tarkovsky as a religious person. So, and um, so he often put religious imagery uh, into his films, even when he shouldn't have been as a Soviet filmmaker. So this is something uh, that we'll see in this dream sequence as well, actually. So I'm just gonna play a little part of this uh, sequence. Uh, hopefully it'll be interesting for people. Um, I'll just uh, get the uh, screen up there. 
So I'm just going to find this clip. There we go. So I'll just get my timings. Uh, 104.52, there we go. All right, 104.52. So yeah, this is a boy whose parents have been killed uh, by the Germans, by the Nazis. So he becomes a scout and he, he tries to sort of, uh, that, that's like the occupation that he takes up. And this is him uh, dreaming about uh, a different time in his life. Okay, so even though we're not, I won't play the whole sequence so that we don't run out of time. Uh, but uh, the key point there is, uh, okay, so if we look at, say, for instance, Carl Jung's theories here, one of his key archetypes is something called an archetype of transformation. So this is like a location rather than a person that can appear in a dream. Um, and uh, forests are like seen as like, um, like important locations that could be, uh, in a dream because they can like have some different meanings that people can attach to them. Uh, for example, uh, looking for some kind of meaning, uh, maybe being lost and uh, trying to find a way out of a place, like to try and find some sort of clearing or something like this. And uh, obviously in this movie, a character whose parents have been killed and he's trying to like find some kind of meaning. Uh, perhaps this is something that this uh, could mean in this particular sequence. Uh, on top of that, we have rain, uh, which is falling on the character. This is like a common technique using uh, water is like a common technique in many of uh, Tarkovsky's films. It's like a like a common thing that he comes back to many times in the sound of water. The water can have many symbolic meanings, like, for example, uh, to do with baptism and also to do with um, to do with like cleansing away of sins or like washing away like bad like darkness or something like this so these are some potential meanings at least that the water can have and then on top of that uh, we have the apple and the apple we know it can be uh, used in for example some religious text to do with like the garden of eden for example and the apple can be um, about like a loss of innocence um, it could be like um, uh, if, if somebody was to take a bite from this apple um, it could be like a, it, it could have it could have some kind of symbolism in that way but it could also have some symbolism that it could be planted maybe and start things new from afresh. Um, also, on a more practical level, earlier in the film, just before the dream, um, Ivan and two soldiers he's with uh, have been eating a very plain, very boring meal. Uh, and uh, obviously Ivan can remember back to when he had really nice food, for like fresh food. And uh, obviously he's thinking back to, to when times were better, when they were pleasant, more pleasant, when they were happier. So these is like some different aspects of what the dream can mean in this particular sequence. Right, we'll keep going. I'm, I, hopefully I'm okay for time, Bogdan. You tell me if I'm running out of time. I'm going to go for like five more minutes, if that's all right. And then that's I'll fine. Everything right. is fine. Right, okay, no problem. So, yeah, so, we'll, so we're just trying to get a balance on the time there. So these are some of the key themes in the war movies anyway, and uh, feel free to like challenge or not challenge or whichever, but this is what I noticed. And uh, I, I really think it's important when we're like analyzing film is to try not to put your own kind of like, um, I don't know, like presumptions on your findings. And I was quite surprised by some of these things that came up actually. I wasn't, 
some might seem obvious, but I was quite surprised by the by 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 what I found when I when I look back on these dream sequences. So the key links, uh, what I was noticing, is that a very common or important aspect in the uh, themes of these war dreams, uh, one of the very prominent elements is this idea of there's like a, clo a very close relationship, right? It's a very close relationship. And this is what the dreaming figure in the middle of like a war situation, this is something that they um, call upon in their dreams or something that occurs in their dreams. So in the movie, Woman on the Beach, this guy, uh, the lead character at the start of the film, He's, a, he's, he's got PTSD, he's got this from his bad experience of his ship sinking when he was in the Navy. And he dreams of this like dream woman who will like save him, who will help him. And in the film, I'll Be Seeing You, very similar dream. Uh, it's like a waking dream, really. But in this movie, also a character is, a, is, is reliving an experience uh, from, from the war. Uh, and he's, uh, he's becoming very tense and very nervous and very anxious. But then he thinks of a person who's, uh, who, who he's in love with, and this helps him calm down. Uh, we saw in Flags of, your, uh, Flags of Our Fathers, we saw that the wife of the character who wakes up from his nightmare or from his bad dream, uh, uh, this person sort of like, um, I don't know, this person sort of comforts him. Uh, in Ivan's childhood, he dreams of a young girl um, in music in darkness. The character dreams of a woman who uh, he's in love with. So in each one of these sequences, this is like a really important element um, of, of these dreams. Uh, several of the dreams focus on being being alone, which I thought was quite interesting think topic or an important topic to think of. Because when we think of people often in an army, we think of them being like a group in a group of many people, like a very large group of people who are all like in a team together or something like that. But actually, uh, perhaps uh, what this shows is that uh, when people who are in a wall uh, are dreaming, perhaps, perhaps what it reflects from a filmmaking perspective is that when it comes down to like really big moments, like if a person will live or die or some sort of like very tense situation actually that one okay hello yeah, that, yeah. Then what... we will mute don't worry yeah so what it can show is um yeah it, it, it can show that when when a person perhaps is facing whether they'll live or die at that moment this is actually quite a solitary experience for for people perhaps at least that's what filmmakers are suggesting that when it comes to this moment when you're in a very dangerous situation, you might be in an army with many hundreds of other people or thousands of other people, but that moment is just you facing an enemy, for example, or facing a chance of whether you'll survive or not survive. And I think that's what the filmmakers are trying to show. And sometimes perhaps they're also trying to show that a person... Um, well, I also think sometimes when, when you're making a movie, you need, the, you need the audience to be able to sort of understand or emotionally identify with the topics and themes. And I think if you focus on just one person, it helps the audience more easily uh, uh, sympathise or empathise with that lead character. So I think that's another reason why they isolate one character. So it encourages to just think how that one person's feeling. Um, several of the films deal with just annihilation. So, for example, Buffalo Soldiers, a character dreams that he drops out of the sky and hits the ground. Journey's End, we already saw where a bomb goes off in a trench. Uh, and in Dreamscape and Terminator 2 and in Watchmen, in all three of those films, the dreamer is killed by a nuclear explosion, uh, well, or sees a nuclear explosion. So, yeah, uh, Interstellar, it's a plane that crashes. So this is a common theme as well um, in many of these uh, dream sequences. Uh, quite a few of the dream sequences include characters who are suffering from anxiety. Um, so they're anxious about certain uh, aspects, which you'd ex obviously expect uh, in, a, in a war situation. So this is a common theme as well uh, in many of the dream sequences. There's a couple where somebody thinks about when times were better 
So that's Ivan's childhood, obviously, did that in the dream sequence you saw there. And in a film called Born on the 4th of July, uh, where uh, Tom Cruise, this is another film where it's a, a, a depicting a, a real person. This is like, uh, it's called Ronkovic, or Ronkovic, and he's a, a, he was a person who was uh, injured in the Vietnam War, uh, seriously injured. And he has a dream that he can walk and run again. So uh, this is like, um, but surprisingly, it's not in that many of the dream sequences that I looked at, at least. Um, so it, they seem to mainly focus on either love um, in close relationship. So it's either love or else otherwise it's like uh, anxiety and then uh, and these other topics that I've, I've highlighted here. So uh, depending how we was to look at these dream sequences, we can look at them from, uh, for example, anti uh sort of way. And we can say that these dreams are like uh, threats. Many of these dreams are threat simulations, how to cope with being in a very dangerous situation uh, and how to survive them. Um, or we could look at like from a different, we could look at like maybe like psychoanalytic theory and think, well, is there some sort of underlying sort of meaning or something like that? But um, just, I'd just like to say that Freud himself uh, in his theories, uh, when he, um, one of the main problems he had with his own dream theories that he struggled with actually is the PTSD dreams of World War I uh, soldiers. And it was one of the one things that he really struggled with. Uh, and in Beyond the Pleasure Principle, he tries to address that by adapting his dream theory to account for PTSD dreams, but it's definitely one of those things that it's, you know, it's difficult to equate a PTSD dream with a childhood wish and a childhood sexual fantasy, no matter how you try to bend uh, what the dream might mean. It's quite difficult to, um, to do that uh, with uh, like uh, some of these dreams. And he himself conceded that maybe there is this one type of dream that isn't following the rest of his theory, uh, which obviously creates cracks then in, in, in that theory, in his dream theory in general. Um, so, yeah, uh, there's different ways that we can look at these dream theorists. I think that the anti revanso theory is very strong for like dream sequences, but uh, in film. But this Hobson proto-consciousness theory about how dreams are in general just preparing us to deal with day-to-day -day events, what can happen in our lives, um, obviously also can be like uh, equated to many of the sequences that I've discussed. And I do think that um, some of the figure, some of the uh, things that we see in these dream sequences relate well as well also to Carl Jung's theories. So for example, uh, this idea of archetypes of transformation, uh, this, uh, if we think about uh, someone being alone on a battlefield, then that battlefield becomes the archetype of transformation. It's like a, a moment where that person, uh, something important's happening for that person, like a, a, a change or a turning point for them, something like that. That's everything that I'd, I'd plan to talk about. I hope, I'd hope I don't overrun too much. I've tried to keep within the time limit. Um, so I, I know I've overrun a little bit, but hopefully I've not overrun too much. Hopefully I kept you with me. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> right, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Billy. Okay. Uh, in the, in, indeed, a very interesting uh, selection. Uh, of course, we have uh, many questions, but before we proceed to this section of uh, today's talk, I invite uh, our second speaker, Stanislav Salek, who can share with us his uh, ideas behind drafting a dream sequence in a film for which he prepared scenario in the 90s and to my knowledge this film is also connected to the war situation or let's say post-war situation and i ask uh, those of you who uh, speak english uh, please switch to ukrainian uh, sorry to english language in the lower bar of our zoom uh, since uh, stanislav is going to, to, to speak in ukrainian and we have simultaneous translation, so please uh, follow the bar and switch to the other language. And uh, I am very happy to welcome Stanislav Tsalik, 
He is the old friend of ours and a well-known author and the screenwriter who works for various online and offline platforms. He has been awarded multiple times for his texts. He is the member of the Ukrainian Film Academy and the National Union of Film Artists and the Association of European Journalists. Stanislav researches and writes not only about films, but also about cities. He also uh, stayed under the scholarship residency in our Center for Urban History. And I am giving the floor to Stanislav. Thank you very much. Good evening to everyone. Today, I would like to talk not as a film historian, but uh, as the author of the screenplay uh, where the film used dream sequences. I am going to talk about the film that uh, came out in 1996. Today, I realized that I started writing this screenplay in 1993, so we are going to have the anniversary soon. The title of the film is Juden Christ or the Eternal Will by the National Dovzhenko Film Studio. This is the Ukrainian uh, film, fiction film, and also the location, the setting is in the Second World War in Ukraine and specifically in Bukovina region where before the World War II, it was part of Romania, and then Soviet authorities came there, and then Romanians and Germans uh, invaded back, and then Soviets came back again. So this is a kind of a madly geographical mix, even though the setting is taking place in the same city of Chernivtsi. It is not named there in the film, but this is like the provisional a city even though the action and the setting is during the war but we present it in a different way rather than a billy shared this is just another option another solution with the film director vasil dombrovsky we decided it initially to design these dreams in a different way first of all they're going to be realistic then they will be in color so visually they will be no different from the main uh, action and setting it was crucial and i will explain why we needed that these are not the memories of the protagonists of the characters there are three dreams we use this technique three times in the film these are not memories or recollections of the characters and uh, these dreams are not directly related uh, with the hostilities so what do we have there this technique of dream sequences we needed it there to separate uh, the uh, hopes of the characters i mean of how they would dream and think about what would happen next to them in their lives and then we wanted to compare to the actual reality that was happening i believe that many of you faced it in your lives when you dream about something you have a dream about it and it comes true after some time but very often in a very different manifestation different from your uh, wishes sometimes the consequences are quite opposite we're not talking about the causes to this but we are trying to show this in our film and uh, first you have the dream that is trying to show what the character wanted to be and then we see how this dream is uh, coming to reality but in the opposite way in with the opposite consequences let me be more specific so there is the female character the uh, simple village girl named marichka from the village in bukovina 
she goes to the big city. This is no name city, but this is Chernivtsi, basically. And she has a dream to become a singer. Of course, they cannot uh, accept her to the theater. She understands that. So she finds the job of a maid in the family of uh, Mr. Liberson, a uh, well-known uh, orchestra uh, conductor. Uh, impersonated by the actor Stupka. Uh, she accepted that job because he promised her that he would teach her to sing and then she would sing in the theater. And he is the uh, orchestra conductor in that theater and she believes uh, he would uh, help her. After some time, she would tell him, I am working as a maid for you. You have never taught me to sing or anything. I'm leaving, I don't need that. And he realizes eventually that he needs to do something about that. And he tells her, I will take you to the theater tomorrow. You have never been there. So he takes her along to the theater, his wife and this maid. And there is the uh, Don Juan there. She is a simple girl. She doesn't quite understand all of these sophisticated uh, place on the stage. But she realized one important thing that there was this uh, man in the Santa that every woman fell in love with. And she also has a dream of that uh, Don Juan. And she she has that dream about uh, him. And she's trying to imagine it as she can. So she thinks there is a small book of a nut town. And then this uh, Prince uh, Don Juan comes on a white horse to that village and all other women saw that handsome man and they would all rush after him. They uh, killed uh, their drunken husbands and they would chase this man trying to ask him to notice them. There's so many of them and he has to escape and to flee because there are so many of them. He doesn't know what they want from her. And he climbs the tree and they are kneeling and begging, please come down. And he says, well, the women are kneeling in front of me. What is happening? And uh, being so ashamed, he really falls under the ground. And this is the dream she has. And that dream actually comes true very soon because the political changes are taking place. The Second World War uh, comes. So here comes a handsome man on the white horse, the Red Army officer, commander, who actually was stationed in the apartment of this uh, theater conductor. And obviously, they developed a romantic relationship. Uh, this Marichka girl and this Don Juan uh, officer, but uh, the uh, developments uh, turn out quite different because she gets pregnant uh, and the Red Army uh, retreats from that town. Then she has a baby and he comes back and she would rush, don't you remember me? This is our son and he is uh, looking at her with, in surprise. He might not even remember because several years passed and he tells uh, to everyone, please take this crazy lady away and he leaves on that car. So it turned out differently than she thought. And there is another dream in that film when this Red Army officer comes to that town and he tells to the local citizens about the future of communism, about the principles of new life. Uh, there will be no money. Everything will be given out free of charge in the stores. Everyone will be equal and stuff like that. And there is this character, the local Al Capone, who financially controls the entire town and his name is Samson Shek. He also came to that uh, meeting and he was listening to all of this uh, uh, delusion and he would still ask, but who's going to pay for all of this? Because you cannot live without money. And he, this Red uh, Army officer says, you're going to pay for that. And this Marichka, who was also attending this meeting, she sees that dream and she understands the situation in her own way. So here comes the dream. She is there with uh, his 
uh, with her, she is there with her uh, another boy who was courting her before that red commander so this um, uh, boy Vonchik, they are staying in this tavern according to her it's a luxurious place it's not but she believes it is luxurious but the point is that they could order any dishes in any quantities the most tasteful things free of charge according to how the red officer explained uh, this is how she understood it however the waiter in her dream is actually this uh, local mafia man samson chick and he would bring a dish and after another and after another and then at some point he would say all right i will give you as many dishes as you want but there is one dish covered with the uh, cover you cannot open it because otherwise everything else disappears you can order anything except for this as soon as he said it, Marichka lost interest in all of this communism and all of this never-ending free of charge uh, food. And she encourages that Vonchek boy, let's check what is there. He says, of course, we cannot do this. Of course, we can do that. But what if there is some food that I could never imagine? And now I will know. And he said, you can't do this. And she is, this is a dream, a uh, quite comical dream, actually not the recollection the lyrical recollection or anything but eventually she managed to convince that one chick that they would at least uh, peep into uh, under this uh, uh, cover and nobody would learn so they would uh, open slightly that uh, plate and the bed uh, would uh, fly out and uh, escape so the weight uh, noticed that and he said uh, if there is a woman in this world there will be no heaven or no communism never ever no paradise and then this is the the dream that actually explains well this communism has never happened uh, in a broad sense and also in that uh, specific story in that little town why because the red army retreated and there is uh, the third dream this wife of this theater conductor also has a dream actually marichka got pregnant from this red commander and that wife of that theater conductor she didn't have children but uh, she's quite uh, uh, i mean high morality woman even too much uh, she cannot even admit uh, any a child in her house that was born outside the marriage and she would uh, refer to this biblical story and she interprets it in her own way like there was the a virgin mary in one uh, little town in bukovina and then she had a baby so she's trying to justify that situation for that maid because she cannot accept the uh, reality because uh, it goes against her high morality. It could never happen in her house. So the story, the plot of that dream, it's not about the sequence of events, but it is about the uh, contrast of the dreams and the reality of how we think about things and how they actually turn out uh, in life. So this is why I needed this technique of dream sequences in that film. And uh, they also have more meaning than this local story relation, because if we take them out of the story of the film, we will just have the linear plot, uh, how uh, the government uh, replaced each other during the second world war the red commander comes she gets pregnant it's a banal story but these uh, three inserts uh, bring a certain uh, uh, volume and depth uh, to this uh, film and also these dreams are trying to illustrate that this is not the realistic story as we might see in the Hollywood movies, but this is sort of the reference to the typical Ukrainian poetic films uh, uh, from the 1960s. And uh, 
they never happened again. You cannot uh, uh, really replicate it. Uh, but this is sort of the reflection 30 years after, so to say. This is the way to adapt that uh, Ukrainian poetic uh, film in the context of the 1990s, as illustrated by our screenplay. I'm sorry if I wasn't consistent enough in my um, presentation, but this is how it is, and this is how we see this screenplay. Thank you, Stanislav. We are shifting to English. Uh, and I ask Billy to come back to us. <laughs> Uh, since we have some uh, question after, questions after this, and uh, Stanislav Talek's uh, uh, reflections on his personal uh, needs to in, kind of to impose, not to impose, but to, like to, to, to design, yes, uh, dream sequences in the film about the post-war region uh, show the agency of the screenwriter. So the, 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 my, my question to you, Billy, is, uh, how do you, uh, how did you make uh, uh, the, your selection of films that you studied for your research work, and did you take into account such uh, aspects as uh, screenwriters' agencies? Uh, like in the case of Stanislav, we see clearly that uh, by including dreams into the film, he had several references, like. This is evident that he kind of tried to switch modes between reality and unreal, so real, unreal, expectations and, and some fairy reality. But then on the other side, he also made kind of clear references to the history of film, at least history of Ukrainian. So making kind of this poetic mode of, of making film. So did, did you uh, basically uh, follow these uh, aspects like personal agencies and screenwriters uh, and uh, there was another question, but I will ask it after after your answer. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I, I think that to to answer that question, what I did was um, I tried to when I selected the films, the key thing was to try uh, the original group of films that I looked at. It was to try to make sure I picked ones from different countries um, and genres and uh, eras to try to make sure that I've got quite a broad selection of films uh, that was one thing uh, in terms of uh, whether it's the script writer or screen the screenplay writer or whether it's the director or some other member of the filmmaking group what I was really concerned with was um, to, to, to be honest what I did was I, I was just I was just selecting the dream sequences um, because it's difficult to sometimes know um, who um, I don't know who who is the, like main guiding person in creating a, a film. Often it's the director who gets the credit, but you know it, I think that sometimes that we know it can be misplaced. It could be that the screenplay, the person who writes the, the script writes the might actually be the driving force or the production designer, for example. Um, so when I was picking it, I was um, sometimes I did pick ones who were by specific directors purely because they like recognized as directors who use dream sequences and I felt it would be incomplete. So Spellbound, uh, the Hitchcock dream sequence uh, created with Dali, uh, some Luis Buñuel films, some Bergman film, some Tarkovsky film. I think the, re the research would have been lacking if I hadn't have included those. But then I did just try to create others from a wide range of different filmmakers uh, and so some of the other clips that I've used, um, perhaps the film that, for example, like um, a lot of the films that I selected, like Interstellar, for example, or some Ingvar Berben films, or some Tarkovsky films, sometimes they will be the screenwriter and the director, you know, or they'll, they'll be like certainly having a lot of input there. Um, I'm just trying to think if there's anywhere I picked them where it was the screenwriter himself. Uh, it was the main influence. Give me one moment and I shall uh, check that. Uh, da, 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 da. I think that I would probably say that I didn't, I didn't pick any specifically because of the screenwriter. I definitely didn't do that. But I did pick dream sequences where the filmmakers wanted to put across some kind of hidden meaning sometimes. Um, so that could have been whichever part of a film crew who was like concerned with, with doing that. Yeah, 
I think that's the thing what I try and say. I hope that answers to a point, yeah. Because it's difficult sometimes. Filmmaking's collaborative, isn't it? So um, often one or two people get the credit, usually the director, whereas often it's really many other people who've uh, had, a, like the script writer, have had a like, much bigger influence than they're often credited with, you know? That's my answer. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay. I also, I also have a, a question to Stanislav. Uh, Stanislav, do you agree with this reading of uh, Tarkovsky apples and rain and uh, metaphorical images uh, in Ivanovo Dietstvo, this film? Uh, or maybe you can comment on more like on poetic mode whether this was a kind of typical attitude in the Soviet cinema making or specifically Tarkovsky's uh, take on these sequences. Well, me as a Ukrainian filmmaker, I would rather interpret these apples as the reference to Dovzhenko, because this is the key archetype of Ukrainian filmmaking. There is this apple garden that he planted first in this Kyiv film studio, now named after him. And then when they were relocated to Moscow, he also planted the apple trees there, uh, the big apple tree garden that he made. This was a very important symbol of this person of uh, the important figure, Ukrainian filmmaker. When we think about dreams, well, it's not a widespread and popular technique in the Soviet times. I might be mistaken because I have not researched into that specifically, but the first thing I would think of is, is Tarkovsky because I, I remember that very well. But obviously, dreams have been used earlier, starting from Zvenehora film by Dovzhenko, maybe still earlier even, in the silent movies. They obviously have been used in the pre-Soviet times. But um, all of, obviously, they, they were used uh, with the very practical utilitarian objectives, like, for example, in the musical comedies in vaudevilles. Uh, uh, you understand why the dream would be used there. But apples, for me personally, that would be about Dovzhenko figure. To our uh, participants, and if you want to ask a question, please uh, go into the reactions uh, bar and raise your hand and I will then uh, uh, give you the mic or whatever we have here, technically. Uh, uh, I also have uh, another question to Billy. Uh, did you encounter, this was not only my question, several people asked, uh, uh, dream sequences in documentaries. Is it, is it ever uh, possible, <laughs> actually? Um, well, I think, um, I think, in terms of dream sequences in documentaries, the only one, the film that sort of pops into my head, just because I obviously weren't expecting to ask that question. Um, I think um, there's a film called My Winnipeg, which is by a director called Guy Madison, where it's like a kind of, uh, it, it mixes styles. So it's him reflecting on the town where he came from. And he's sort of talking about, um, so it, it's like part, you could argue, I suppose, it's partly like a reflect, like a documentary on like his experience of his growing up, and uh, in that see in that movie, that kind of constantly fluctuates between dreamlike images combined with uh, him narrating, and and this kind of thing. So I think, and so I think that, that that's an example. There are some films I think probably that do it, but. Um, I would imagine that in a documentary, unless it was a reconstruction of a key dream that someone had, I think it's quite rare, isn't it? Um, I, uh, the films I was looking at, um, for example, the film Sex and Drugs and Rock and Roll, which is the biopic of a, a rock star called Ian Dury, um, in that film, which is a true, it's like a telling of his life, 
Uh, there's several dream sequences in that film that Ian Jury has. Um, so, you know, there's films like that where they're biopics and it shows people having dreams. Um, so perhaps that falls a little bit into that bracket, what you're saying there, maybe. So perhaps in some biopic films, you know, um, I would imagine that's something that's going to come around, come, come around uh, uh, where a character's had a key dream that was like very important to him as a person, you know. Oh, oh Luis Buñuel as well, I often, and, and these other filmmakers, often they use the real dreams that they've had and then they put them in the story. So the war dream from Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie about a soldier saying how he meets his mum on the street, that's actually a dream that Luis Buñuel really had and then he just put that in the, in the movie. So there you've got like a real dreamt event that's put into a fictional tale. So you get that as well. You know, uh, all of the dreams in the movie are all but one in Kurosawa's movie uh, film Dreams. All of the dream sequences in that, I think, except for one are real dreams that people had. So maybe there's like a blurring of the lines of a documentary there as well. Maybe. Yeah, Th thank you. Uh, in regard to comparing two collections, like your selection of films and our selection of dreams that we collected since February to 2022, I can confirm that we have a lot of, uh, these are not, of course, uh, films, but real dreams, yes. So in real dreams, we have a lot of uh, being alone. Uh, that was, uh, it's very interesting that you put it on the top and I, I've seen this being alone. And then in many dreams, people recall that they are alone or they have some imaginary creature, like uh, it can be a dog or a cat or someone with whom they have kind of these, I would say protected close relations. So they are not that kind of uh, manifested. Yes, so sometimes in dreams, people are alone or with somebody who represents a close one or someone. So someone who is close to, to the person. And we don't have you know, a kind of like war annihilation, but we have uh, often recalls that dreams end up with some violence, yes? Yeah? So yeah, it's, it's a kind of, it corresponds with your with anxiety. So it corresponds with, with your take on this, these theories of uh, threat simulation. So probably many people who are dreaming uh, now in Ukraine, they they have this kind of threat simulation, uh, uh, I don't know, it's like trope, we can say. Uh, we have a question from Magdalena Zolkos, please go ahead, Magdalena. Um, hi, everybody. Um, thanks, Billy. Um, oh, thank you both. Thanks to both speakers. This was really fascinating. Um, so what, what strikes me in those, the first two um, sequences that you showed, Billy, was that they had to do with like onaeric mediation of direct experience of battle. And what is so interesting about the project on war diaries, dreams, but more broadly diaries, is that they kind of complicate war experience that maybe doesn't have to do always with this immediate proximity to battle, right? Or maybe this sort of directly acquired image of a battlefield, but it it can you know, it can have to do with other sensorial experiences like sounds and um, affects and sights and so on. So I wonder what they first, like whether you have experience uh, or examples of these cinematic sequences of dreams that would have to do with like indirect experience of battle, but maybe even more interesting for me would be to hear you speak about how do you think um, dream sequences in movies complicate the experience, complicate the question of what it means to experience war. Okay, let me just look at my um, notes here so I can just uh, make sure that I'm accurate in what I say. <laughs> right, so I've got my list here, so this will be helpful for me. So to answer that question, um, I would say, hmm, Okay, well, I'm just trying to find a good example that I can I can use. So, firstly, I suppose 
one example, partially that meets what you're saying, if you think about in the film Dreams, which is the Akira Kurosawa movie, in that he has a few different dream sequences, one of which is a war dream. And it's about a soldier who is a commanding officer who's returning from battle, right? And he's returning from battle and he work, walks through a very long tunnel. And when he gets to the other end of the tunnel, he meets a soldier who he was in, con he was in charge of. And that soldier doesn't believe that he's dead. So the, the commanding officer has to explain to him that he's died because the soldier doesn't realise that he's dead. That's the dream that he's having. So it's kind of a guilt dream, really, from the commanding officer because he feels responsible because it was him who commanded the soldiers to attack, thus leading to the death of this person. So that is an example of where it doesn't show somebody on a battlefield. It actually shows someone after the battle uh, when they're returning home. Um, but they still... Um, a kind of um, the, 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 the consequences of uh, are coming back to them and they're still haunting them. So it, he's still remembering the battle, but it never shows the battle. He's just seeing like the consequences of the battle. So that's like one example, I think, of a, of a war dream that does that. Um, let me just think another way that this can be done is um, in the film Apocalypse Now, in that movie, um, what they do in that is they have they don't show an actual dream sequence, but they have an audio tape recording of Colonel Kurtz that a spy has got hold of or something like that. And what it is is it's a uh, Kurtz uh, recounting a dream that he had. So someone's recorded the dream that is that he's had, and the dream that he's had it's like quite a disturbing dream. It's about watching a snail crawling along a razor blade. Um, that's the dream that he's had, right? So like a strange dream. So I think that there what's happening is that in that dream, when Kurtz is talking, Kurtz is showing that he's quite a sort of... He's, he's, I think it's implying that he's quite a disturbed person and that he's like on the edge of like acting different ways, reacting of, of, of like... Um, he's quite a... Yeah, he's quite a sort of like disturbed person. But it doesn't ref show any war in that sequence. It doesn't show any direct conflict in that sequence or anything like that. So I think those are some possible examples. Um, more broadly, there's definitely dream sequences where characters have like one thing shown in the dream, but it's actually like referring to something much harsher or worse in their life, you know. But yeah, I think in the war dreams, because they need to make when a movie, a filmmaker makes the movie, they need the audience to all really clearly kind of read it the same way. You know, they need it. So I, I, it's a lot of the time, these dream sequences in the war films are quite clear what they're depicting. Um, so that like there's no misunderstanding. So everyone can understand the dream the same way in the movie theater at the same time. So it's probably like not that common what you're asking about. Uh, in war films specifically. But, um, I mean, even in Ivan's childhood, you know, the kid is dreaming about uh, having loads of apples on a cart, very happy, but in the background there's a thunderstorm all the time. So there's something bad going on in the background all the time, even when he's dreaming about these nice things. Um, so there's an undercurrent that there's a threat or something bad going on while he's dreaming about this, like, positive thing. So I think that's an example of um, where he's dreaming about the war, really, but it's kind of like he's, he's thinking about something nice, but we know he's thinking about something nice because something horrible is happening in real life when he's awake. So that could be another example of that. Is that all right? Is that okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's <laughs> definitely. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> but in general, what is your take on this problematization? Because uh, a problematization, I mean, uh, as Magdalena asked, uh, uh, how reading dreams in films can help us to read uh, real dreams, or vice versa. So, uh, do we uh, do we read uh, dreams in films? like uh, normal dreams, I mean, because you use theories which explain uh, kind of personal uh, experiences of people or collective experiences. And then film itself, we normally treat as a form of dreaming, yes, or 
cultural manifestation. But then, what is your take on this? How whether we take these dreams in films as if they are dreams? I think that um, it. I really think it can depend because I think it. I think sometimes, obviously, as as I mentioned before, a lot of the reason that we show the dreams in the movie is because we want to tell something in the story that we can't tell some other way without it feeling very clumsy. So, for example, if a character's got some kind of anxiety, um, the character could say, I am now feeling anxious because, or there could be subtitles underneath that says, this character is actually feeling anxious because, but it would feel really clumsy if they did that. But if instead it shows someone dreaming, the audience has seen enough films already to understand that this is going to show some sort of hidden information or new information. Um, and so I think the audience, I'm, I, I, I think how I understand it, the audience buys into that and sort of goes along with it. Um, so, but I do think that there are some dream sequences where they can have some sort of hidden or additional meaning. Um, uh, so some examples of that be, would be where filmmakers have took real dreams that they've really had and then they put them into a movie. So, for example, uh, Discreet Charmer Bourgeoisie, Bunuel putting an actual dream that he's had. Um, in some, um, uh, like, there's a range of different filmmakers who've included, like, real dreams, what they've had uh, into the story. And uh, once that's happened, once someone's tried to film a real dream, what they've had, obviously that dream can then have a, different, a range of different sort of subtext that even the filmmaker might not be aware of. Uh, and then you also get filmmakers like, for example, David Lynch, uh, the American director. And in his films, he purposefully creates very obscure meanings for dreams uh, in his films. So, for example, in the movie Lost Highway, uh, there's some very like quite a controversial film. But some of the dream sequences in, in that movie, have, have, they're not like very clear or very obvious meaning uh, for the audience. And that's on purpose you know, to, to challenge the audience, really. So I do think that some filmmakers do create dreams that are like not just story just simple storytelling vehicles. Uh, they do have some complexity in there. Um, so there's that. Uh, and then on top of that, of course, we can always like analyze a piece of work that someone's created and look for new meanings in that. So even though a filmmaker may have created a dream sequence a specific way, I do think that you can analyze the dream sequence and you can find other meanings that are also included in that, that the filmmaker might not have intended or at least the viewer can take from it, you know? And I do think that they can help you understand your own dreams because I think if you watch a dream sequence and try and pull it apart, try and think what might it mean, what might some hidden meanings be, by doing that, you're practicing. And, and if you practice on a, a dream sequence from a film, then when you have your own dream, you can use those that practice that you've done to try and break your own dream down. So you've had a run through, you know, you've watched the dream sequence in whichever film, you thought, oh, I wonder what that means. And then you think, what underlying meanings could it have? And discuss it with some people maybe. And then when you have your own dream and you come uncertain about it, you've had a practice run. So um, you can then perhaps break your own dream down uh, more accurately or more skillfully. So I, I do think it's helpful to... Um, to look at, um, even if it's just as a training exercise to understand your own dreams better, you know? And some people report to us that they, uh, I, I, I had a dream that I, is as if I was in a movie, you know? Oh, <laughs> <Some right. point. laughs> yeah, yeah, it's that, yeah. Yeah, it can yeah. get very uh, complicated dream, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, my, uh, I, again, encourage people to, to ask questions. We have, uh, professor who, who worked uh, with dream sequences and films for many years and I was stunned by your exhaustive list of uh, possible uh, possible attitudes yes how to how to depict a dream uh, in such a cultural form as film which shows basically that uh, there are some repetitive and repetitive modes yes uh, and again it shows that we have some more kind of rather general human cultural representations that can be in dreams and in other forms. 
we have some comment in my dreams i made my own movies yes people say that in dreams they make movies <laughs> there are also forms of therapies that that uh, uh, those who are under treatment ask uh, specifically to dream as if they are making a movie or as if they see a sequence of a movie and very often their life is compared to movies yeah interesting yeah i have i have maybe one more question if because if, if people don't have more questions then we can let you go okay. <laughs> since it's already late or we have one more question but then i i, I just want to ask you uh, do you think uh, yeah before we proceed with another question uh, my question is normally uh, when i say to other people from outside of the center for urban history that we collect dreams they normally kind of a bit astonished or uh, uh, they don't get the point why do historians need to collect such fairy stories like dreams and uh, I, I often have to find kind of words why it is important and uh, what would be your take why basically dreams are important for understanding some periods or times or whatever well I would say that personally, um, we know that we spend, you know, we, we probably don't, but we're supposed to spend like seven or eight hours asleep every night. We know a lot of us don't if we're working sometime, but in theory, that's what we should be doing. And quite a high percentage of that time we do spend dreaming. So uh, there are some arguments that dreams are only like a byproduct. It's like the reason that people dream is it's like a secondary. It's like connected to some other issue in the brain. Uh, and it's like a, a non-harmful byproduct, and that's why people still dream. But I, th I think that's like, to my mind, that's like a, a, a sort of like, like would you say, like a minority view. And I, and uh, we know that people who don't dream, um, it's a very it can have very bad uh, detrimental effect for them. So um, it's very the vast majority of people do dream unless they've had some kind of brain trauma or. Uh, some or they have some very serious like uh, medication that they're on people do dream so we can say that dreaming does serve a purpose there's some sort of point to it there's some sort of reason to it so i think that uh, when people are awake when they have a thought when they have an idea they'll write it down and think oh i had an interesting thought or idea and they might use that as a way to construct a new invention or to come up with a new theory or to uh, something like this and I think that, you know, when you're dreaming, that your brain's still working, you're still coming up with, uh, uh, so you're still being creative, um, you're still uh, generating ideas. And uh, I think personally, even if, if you just look at dreams from that perspective, um, I think that they can generate some ideas that you, pro you wouldn't come up when you're awake, you know. Uh, if you look at things from Hobson's point of view, uh, where he says, where he was looking at brain chemistry, and he was saying different chemicals are more active when you're awake and different chemicals are more and parts of your brain are, are active when you're asleep. So it does mean your brain's operating in a different way. And uh, why not take advantage of that? You know, why not like, um, like look at what or th consider what your brain's running through, what you're running through when you're asleep. And it, maybe it can give you like a nice full rounded uh, knowledge of yourself as a person or maybe like some deeper insights into uh, how things are affecting you, um, like uh, emotionally or physically or something like that. So, you know, even if people don't take any sort of spiritual side to dreaming or something like this, and they just think of it as like a, a purely physical action, I still think that um, it's beneficial, you know, uh, to, to sort of like um, to, to do this. And I think a lot of creative people know that uh, when you're just waking up, as, as you just wake up, if you try and solve a problem just as you wake up, because you've still got like your brain still some dreaming chemicals mixed with some waking up chemicals as the transition switch between the two, you often can problem solve in a different way than when you're consciously fully awake. So I think that demonstrates that um, dreaming can lead to different ways of solving problems, for example. So yeah, I, I personally think that there's value in it, but um, and it, we can see there's lots of artworks and poems and novels and films to demonstrate that interesting thoughts occur when people are dreaming, you know. That's my pro-dream argument anyway. <laughs> uh, 
Thank you, Billy. We have our colleague in. Uh, please go ahead and ask your question. Uh, I'm actually not uh, Vova Pulegin, but he's right next to me. Um, yeah, hi. <laughs> um, my name is Clemens Poole. Uh, thank okay. you for the lecture, um, both Stanislav and Billy. Um, I have a kind of two part question, I guess, part for Bogdan and part for Billy. Um, so, with this kind of, uh, I guess, what could be some thought of as some kind of like data analysis of the content of these uh, film dream sequences. I wonder if uh, the Center for Urban History has done any uh, sort of overall analysis of the content of the dreams that you've collected. I know, uh, Bogdan, you, you mentioned that there were some features that came up in um, Billy's research. So it would be interesting to see uh, or, or to hear if there's been any kind of systematic way of thinking about the, these archive dreams. And then on the other hand, uh, Billy, I, I wonder if you have looked at archives of dreams in your research that are real dreams, not film dreams, and uh, looked at the differences between these dreams that are produced for cinema in order to drive the plot or whatever these different purposes you've discussed, and uh, like where they cross over with actual uh, dreams that have been uh, part of any archives. I can start. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you for this question. Uh, uh, unfortunately, we still uh, didn't start to look deeply into our collection, though we have uh, several uh, inquiries from people from outside, like uh, several artists or curators asked to use dreams in their exhibitions. So we do facilitate this and they uh, we put them in direct contact with people who produce dreams and if they agree uh, some of these dreams are already being used in uh, one in uh, exhibition in poland and in in some artistic uh, works but uh, when it comes to uh, reading or trying to analyze the collection we are only now approaching uh, to this uh, we have a team of international scholars and Magdalena Zolkos who was here is our close friend from Finland and uh, these scholars now have access to these dreams and uh, it takes time so now people read them carefully they try to think and figure out what 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 can get what they can get out of the, those uh, sequences or stories and the same is with me, I encountered to analyze visual dreams because we had several participants who made not, not textual because uh, you have this uh, different uh, kind of genres of producing dreams. So some people recall them, some people record them, some people give interview and tell the story and some people draw, make drawings, yes. So I thought that well, I might uh, analyze these uh, drawings and uh, dreams but it's not easy, <laughs> so uh, frankly saying, <laughs> I'm a kind of a bit locked uh, within uh, uh, some theories and then these works. So I'm still searching for possible, plausible whatever, understanding. Uh, but uh, soon uh, we plan to make the whole collection accessible and clear uh, all the uh, these are not copyrights, but still uh, agreements with, with people who produce dreams. So, yeah, when we will have everything done, we will develop interface and people could read these sequences freely. And then, Billy, please go ahead. Yeah, so, yeah, to answer your question, thanks very much. Um, so, I'd say that uh, in um, doing this research, it was very important for me to read uh, different uh, texts by especially by the four dream theorists that um, I included in my initial research. So, um, and within the books that those people wrote, they use many uh, examples of dreams uh, that they've analyzed uh, in their careers. So for example, Carl Jung uh, in his writing and Freud in his writing and Rivon Suor and Hobson, you know, all of their writings, uh, they use a lot of examples from dreams uh, there. So um, I didn't collect statistical analysis of like how many dreams were about certain topics or something like that. There is work that other people have done on that, but I definitely read 
um, a lot of dream reports uh, in these books, and then by some other theorists who weren't of those four, but also uh, other people who, who, who work in that area. So um, yeah, so there was that. Got there was I was doing that. Um, in terms of like um, comparison uh, between like what we could call real dreams and uh, dream sequences in films. So as I already mentioned, some filmmakers do literally film, make a sequence of a real dream that they've had. So um, an example would be, um, yeah, say like Luis Buñuel um, often did that. He did that on set for several of his films where he, where he tried to create like a, a recreate a dream that he had in a film sequence. Um, I suppose it depends really um, in terms of which uh, dream reports that you look at, because if you look at the dream reports in Freud's books, the key point of Freud's dreams are that they have some different meaning to the actual pictures of the dream. So it's like you have a manifest content, which is the actual dream, which is the dream the person like saw or experienced. But then there's like the underlying latent meaning of the dream. And so they're quite difficult, in it, like I say, in filming usually, um, because um, it's quite confusing for the audience if they all have to watch one dream sequence, but then understand that there's a completely different meaning underneath it. So the way you can get around it is in the film Spellbound, for example, which is the Alfred Hitchcock film, 1945. In that movie, in, in that movie the thing what's different there is that uh, they have two psychoanalysts who, who, who analyse the dream as the lead character says what his dream was. So the audience don't need to have read loads of Freud's books beforehand to be able to understand how to deconstruct the dream. So that's like one way you can sort of do it. But if you use a dream that's like a classic example of psychoanalysis dream, it's quite difficult to include it in a film often because uh, the audience, whatever they're seeing, there's like some hidden meaning what the dream's really about. Um, if you use like what we call these threat simulation dreams, this kind of thing, I think they work quite well from a filmmaking perspective. And I, I would say that like uh, when people talk about threat simulation dreams, the dreams that are described in those writings by say anti Rivonso or and these kind of uh, in these kind of writings, I think they're quite similar um, to like dream sequences that you'd see in a film because that's the key point that there's no hidden meaning. Uh, that a person dreamt that they were like running away from something that threatened them. Um, and then in a film, someone runs away from something that's threatened them. So they're quite similar. So I think it depends which collection of dreams that you look at. If it's a collection of dreams that's been collected by a psychoanalyst, um, they might be like less common to find in movies. Um, if it's like dreams that have been collected by someone who thinks that dreams are threat simulations, probably they have more like commonality with like common links with sequences in movies. That's what I'd say, you know, because usually the dreams that psychoanalysts like are kind of quite boring dreams, right? So it'll be a person who's like one of what Freud talks about is a guy who dreams about a bowl of salt on a table, right? So that would be quite boring in a film, probably be quite a boring thing to watch. But when Freud analyzes it, he says, ah, well, this is like uh, like displacement. And what's happened is this bowl of salt was on this table and it was there the same time this guy's grandmother died. And what's happened is he's, he's suppressed the memory of his grandmother dying. And the only thing he's remembered is this bowl of salt that was on this table. And that's so really underneath it is actually, it's a dream that shows that he's very sad about his grandmother dying. But you wouldn't get that from looking at the bowl of salt. Um, so to fuse it in a film, it would be quite complicated to um, to do that unless you had a psychoanalyst analyst explaining it in the, inside the actual film. So that, yeah. that's my answer. I don't know if it helps, but that's my answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, that's I hope that's all right for you. Yeah. I also, Clements can say that, uh, uh, I mean, we have a lot of anxiety in dreams and fear and anxiety people since we don't collect dreams of soldiers yes so in war dreams we all often have people connected to fighting and we have we are living in the western part of ukraine so it's uh, basically uh, we have a lot of fear but not direct fighting uh, but what what is vivid and uh, visible let's say 
is that uh, people dream a lot about how uh, homes, let's say, like in general, home as something which is threatened by, by also in media or by the current situation, which uh, which I would say shows that for people uh, in Ukraine, home is very important thing. Something like a house and then a home, and then animals. I remember Billy was asking me. I had a dream with my cat. And then Billy was like therapist asking me questions like, okay, cat, what was what is the name of your cat? And he said, Oh, my name is Korzek. What does it mean, Korzek? And I said, like, this is biscuit that I used to eat in my kindergarten or whatever in school. Aha. Uh -huh. So it's not just a cat. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, this was not like a cat. This was my past, my ch childhood memories <laughs> that assisted me in a dream. So yeah, I agree that uh, this Latin meaning uh, can uh, can be complicated and very personal. One but other, all... th one other yeah. thing, Bogdan. Sorry, just to say, if a lot of people are dreaming about their homes, just so you know, uh, you, it's just like an interesting point I just thought of is that, like from Freud's perspective, um, and I think Carl Jung mentioned this also, but this is 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 this idea that if you dream about rooms in a house then you're actually dreaming about your own interior person. And each each built room in the building represents a different thing for a person. So like a bathroom might mean something different to the bedroom, for example, or, a, or an attic or a cellar might all mean something different. So if a person's dreaming about a home, from a threat simulation perspective, you could argue that the person is obviously dreaming that they're worried that their home's going to be destroyed or that they've had to leave their home behind or something like that. But then from a psychoanalytic perspective, you could say, well, actually, that home is like a psychological is like a is like a representation of that person's whole self. And so if a person is scared about the home being destroyed, they're actually you could argue they have a fear of themselves being destroyed uh, because the home represents them as a person. And then if it's like a part of the building, what's they're scared of losing, that could be something to do with a fear of losing their identity, for example, something to do with their identity or something like that. Whereas if it's the whole house that they're dreaming about being destroyed, it might be that they're fearful of themselves being destroyed as a person, you know. So that's like, if you take it as a threat simulation, it's just no hidden meaning. Yeah, you're worried about your house being destroyed. If you take it from psychoanalytic perspective, you could argue that there's this other meaning that it, the person's fearful of himself being destroyed. This is why it's good to try the different dream theories because they all say a bit of truth together, don't they? You know. So yeah, it just made me think of that. Yeah, thank you, thank you. It's very, it's very helpful. In general, I learned uh, learned a lot, uh, and uh, thank you for today's talk, uh, Lily and Stanislav and others. You have also commented in the chat a couple of times i had a dream in dream in dream oh wow <laughs> i had three times to wake <laughs> oh come yeah uh, you have a complicated <laughs> imaginary <laughs> or imagination but uh, yeah i i i i uh, before february uh, of this year i didn't think that dreams can be a, such a great sources to learn wartime or, or you know the, the, the violence period in some culture or country and now i am uh, uh, yeah i'm convinced that these are great sources to study uh, not just emotions but to study much more uh, as as billy showed us uh, if you don't have any further questions we already have like two hours more than two hours talk so everybody is tired and uh, uh, I am very thankful, Billy, for joining us today and giving this brilliant presentation. Uh, thank you, Stanislav, for connecting with us from Poland. Uh, Stan thank you, Svetlana Bregman, for translation and the whole team of the Center for Urban History for doing this. And uh, again, I just want to announce that in, in November, we will have another lecture by Wojciech Owczarski, the extraordinary also researcher who works with uh, recollections of dreams of prisoners of Auschwitz. And this is very important also study. Uh, these, these, these dreams were recorded in the 70s and Wojciech will 
share it with us his research. So please follow our website and our announcements. And again, thank you everybody for coming and especially Billy for, for enlightening us. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, thank you. Bye bye. See you. Bye bye. bye, -bye.